there's very much something unique to the American spirit and that instinct to just go westward. I'd say there's no other continent other than the Americas where people just have this tendency to move west. So before we left Arizona, it was interesting with COVID. Uh, a lot of things were closed, unfortunately. Navajo Nation was closed, but now of course, we are a month later into the trip. And I was just listening to the Navajo Nation news and they started reopening everything. With certain measures in place, mm -hmm. it's not totally open. A soft opening. But that was our, we had a major detour to take in, in terrible weather, in snow, ice, sleep, rain, all of the above. That wasn't fun for me. Hate it. So we left Arizona and entered Utah, a land of multicolored rock and Baroque stone columns. straddled the state line running through Utah on 89 all the way to Kanab, then dipping back into Arizona on 389, which turned into 59 once back in Utah. I wanted to stay in St. George. It looked rather nice in a hotel, and then we ended up camping instead. I definitely pushed my will on that. I did not want to stay in St. George because it was quite expensive, and I wanted to get a little bit farther and uh, try to get the heck out of America because I know that it's way cheaper in Mexico. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we're on a budget. <laughs> and I really wanted to just see the Grand Canyon. And we did. And it was time to get the hell out of there. But unbeknownst to us, we don't really know our own roads and our own country very well. <laughs> so we found out that Las Vegas was on the way. Vegas and I decided well we decided what better time than during a pandemic I've been direct to you out here in Las Vegas yeah we be holding it <laughs> at any rate we drove on through st. George uh, stopped for groceries and back into Arizona to camp after just being spat out of the last mountain pass in northwestern Arizona this is where I had a spill and some loose sand, and uh, it was just near the campsite, damaging my left paneer. Uh, more on that later. This was the first time that we tipped over on the bike. That was my first experience. Actually, I don't think my mother knows yet, but as soon as she watches this, she's going to be very surprised, and I'm probably going to get a phone call. <laughs> Sorry, Chris Simney. <laughs> the next day, we made it to Vegas. Sam wanted me to gamble. <laughs> Travis definitely didn't want to gamble, but he allowed me to spend $20 on the machine. I thought we were doing well for a while and I thought we could keep going. So Travis really lost nothing in this. We enjoyed our time, but we learned that Las Vegas just isn't for us, not our style. Terrible things were happening all around us. The slot machines have an insidious nature about them. The machine has this smooth, almost human-like way of taking your money. There's no whirring sound as your money is inserted. It is just quiet acceptance and a silent false thrill of hitting it big. Vegas as a city from day to night seems to be the perfect personification of split-brained alcoholic depravity. By day it has a kind of character you'd want to stuff in the closet if you had company over. By night it changes faces really quick. It turns into the fantasy world you've been promised. The lights, the shows, the desert air, they all seem to coalesce into an alluring facade that you can't help but be compelled to just sort of stare at. 
Then morning comes, and all the regret of a few hours prior is made strikingly and soberingly real. Then again, I only lost 20 bucks. After that, we are on our way to California. Okay, so I'm in the woman's bathroom, but I had to double check. I walked around the corner, and this is what I saw. Oh my gosh, it scared the crap out of me. Only in California. <laughs> I promised people in California, two of my clients, that I would deliver and receive some product. So I took one of my essential oils to someone who won my monthly giveaway Ooh. from my Instagram. This is so crazy! Hey. Oh, oh, we're what? the winner! Yay. Thank you so much for coming all the way down here. And then I picked up some product, actually these bracelets, some stone bracelets from a girl. It was so cool to actually do business interactions online and then meet them face to face halfway across the country. On the way, we had to go through our last mountain pass, at least getting into California on the West Coast. It was another very windy moment for us. We actually had to stop because there was no wind advisory and it was starting to push the bike around. So we stopped for a while had a coffee, relaxed, and then pushed on forward. And then we went to visit an old college roommate. I'm so glad we got to reconnect after eight years. We stayed with her for a few days. It was very nice to catch up, really enjoying the beach and the more temperate weather. We also got to play with her new puppy. Oh, yeah. That was exciting. Koa, he's a good dog. <laughs> February, and we're about to jump in the Pacific Ocean. How are these people learn that the water is cold? It's game it's time at the Pacific. We're going in, I got my life from me. 23. I took her out, I took her out. It wasn't Friday, Friday night. Friday night. Friday night. I'm here to record it. What's my age again? What's my age again? What's my age again? What's my age again? Whoa, what's up, guys? Guys, this is Chad. This is Chad's band. This is the Tea House. What am I getting to drink? The Rude Boy. Naomi's getting the Rude Boy too. What are you getting, sweetheart? The greaser. Chad's in there whipping it up for us. Watch the magic happen, guys. Boom. We'll let that steep four minutes. All right, here we are in beautiful Redondo Beach. It's where our friend Naomi lives and we come to stay a couple nights with her and catch up with her. She lives in paradise. We just got some teas from the tea house. Mine's orange rooibos with honey. And mine is the greaser, the matcha, like what was it, mocha mate. Mocha nut with caramel and honey, I think. And here's our hostess of the mostess, hey guys. Naomi. And yeah, we are in paradise. Check this place out. Beautimous. Made it a sunny California. We did, thank goodness, because I'm tired of camping in the cold. And next, we are on our way crossing our first border going into Baja, California. Hi, hi, Mexico. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. At any rate, we finally made it. Uh, I had a wipeout when we first got into California from Nevada. Or was it, no, out of Utah into Nevada? We were by so many state borders. Yeah, I totally ate it and had to do a bit of a repair job, but we're back on track. And by I had to do a repair job, I mean this guy. His name's Christian and he's a rock star. He fabricated some metal to fix my paneer. And he also does some pretty sweet jobs with automobiles and bikes and all sorts of stuff in there. Totally custom made. Like that. Oh man, 
just like new. And he also does some pretty sweet metal work with all sorts of automobiles in there. Really cool bikes. I told him about my trip and he even had me name my own price. It was something I didn't expect. He said he also doesn't do this kind of thing much. He was just being kind and helpful to a guy like me just showing up at his front door. Really cool dude. Very grateful to have made it to sunny California. No more cold nights, no more cold mornings. We have arrived. Safe in one piece in the sun with our tea lattes. Cheers to the tea house. <laughs> <laughs> Salir contigo mentioned the American instinct to go west. The truth is that romantic trope has a lot of miles on it. What if it were the reverse though, literally? What if the citizens of the U.S. had an instinct to travel east? What if we wrote from right to left or from top to bottom instead? But really, what would America be like if European colonization wasn't European at all? Now I'm swimming in the godfather of all historical podcasts deep end of the pool. Dan Carlin is chief of historical what-ifs. Many of the lesser-known historical outliers make wild-eyed conjecture over history all the more fascinating. Some people are aware of the sagas of Icelanders and their claims of Leif Erikson being the first European to set foot on continental North America, approximately half a millennium before Christopher Columbus sailed his way into the Caribbean. An even lesser-known fact is the mysterious Piri Reis map, which strongly suggests itself to be the most extensive demonstration of exploration of the New World circa 1510, accurately mapping out the coast of Brazil and even that of Antarctica, with albeit some errors. Dan Carlin's Globalization Unto Death episode highlights the assertion that China was much more in favor of being the global colonizing heavyweight of the 1400s. The Chinese treasure fleet ships dwarfed European ships of the time, only by the 1800s did their caravels ever grow to match the magnitude of those of the Chinese. The Chinese already understood scurvy as a result of a vitamin C deficiency and had an entire extra ship loaded down with topsoil to grow citrus fruits for the sailors along the way. Establishment type historians tend to scoff at and discount claims of Chinese exploration in the Americas predating Columbus as pseudo history. Some people on the fringe of established historian circles still believe that the Chinese did make it to the West Coast traded some things, mentioned returning, and then left. I'm not claiming I know this to be true. It should be noted that a good reason they weren't in the front seat of the old world, new world collision still reverberating today 
is the simple fact that one emperor to the next didn't have the same view of sea travel. Although one emperor may spend most of his life building an immense treasure fleet and put it to good use, his successor might very well be more Confucian-oriented and domestically concerned, allowing the fleet to rot and await another dynasty to recapture its former glory. Arab explorers were probably the next most likely to colonize the Americas. Muslims had already proven they were worth their salt and seafaring by arriving as far as Indonesia, spreading their religion, and establishing trade routes. The aforementioned Pirdi Reis map was made drawing from 10 Arab and 4 Indian maps sourced by way of the Portuguese. It's an interesting alternate universe to imagine Columbus showing up a day late in a buck short, just in time to hear the Islamic call for prayer in the Bahamas. Would the Aztecs be allowed to coexist alongside another geopolitical power that decided to put up a palapa next to their Templo Mayor? What language would hold the title of lingua franca? Would the Spanish Moors have come back and rolled over the rest of Spain and continued through the Pyrenees into France? Would the Enlightenment be no more than a flash in the pan? What if the whole idea of the nation-state and self-determination never takes place and we all still lived in vassal feudal territories linked together in a globalized system? What would the West's predominant philosophy look like having cultural juggernaut cities like Athens and Jerusalem sidelined? Globalization was going to eventually happen one way or the other. These questions don't keep me up at night, but it is compelling for me to not take their outcomes for granted. Things could be a lot different. Who knows if they'd be better or worse if our romantic American tropes spoke of heading east instead of west. And who knows if turning south now from the north will answer anything at all. I just want to see what's going on.